The Tolkien Road, Episode 43, The Silmarillion, Chapter 12, Of Men. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we continue our discussion of the Silmarillion with Chapter 12 of Men. In this short chapter, we learn a bit about the early history of men in Tolkien's secondary world and how they relate to the elves and the Valar. By the way, if you haven't already, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes. We'd love to know what you think of the podcast. Enjoy the show! Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. Tolkien Road! Yeah, with you, as always, this is John. This is Greta. Yeah, I feel like that, I, I'm i never able to get that opening sentence of, like, who is with you to be <laughs> less awkward. It just I feel can, like that was pretty good. Well, I always feel like it comes out really awkward. Hmm. So. Well, maybe we need to practice. This is John, coming at you. Yeah. Maybe well, something that didn't like sound that. awkward at all. Yeah, totally. That totally normal. awesome. Yeah. yeah, totally <laughs> awesome and natural. Well, especially since that's how you talk like most of the time. Yeah. Listener, you've been hearing John's fake voice this whole time. <laughs> that's right. Why? This is actually my fake voice talking like this. I really talk like this all the time. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he laughs like that too. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It's, it is. It awesome. never ever gets annoying. Totally. Like not even a little bit. All right, now I'm gonna talk like a total phony. Okay, talk yeah. like a pony. Yeah. Do it. Hey, we got a problem. What's that? We only have one copy of the Silmarillion. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because someone lost their copy of the Silmarillion. So- Not only did they lose their copy of the Silmarillion, but uh, someone got a little upset at a football match today and threw my copy on the floor. <laughs> and to tape part of it back together. <laughs> Man, kids, they just ruin everything, don't they? They do. Those darn kids. That's right. Losing their temper and throwing stuff. Especially those. Jeez. Yeah. I thought it was pretty funny how the kids kept accusing me of breaking your copy of the Silmarillion. I was like, I didn't break it. How do you? You can't break a book. Exactly. I'm like you can't break a book. It's not like it's a piece of glass. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and apparently. Well, with as hard as you threw it, if there was a way to break a book, I think that would be it. Just yeah, saying. the hardwood floor probably didn't help matters either. Nope. Uh, yeah, I think the party line right now is that the cat ate my book, mm-hmm. my copy of the Silmarillion. Um, so it's very, very bizarre. Like I'm wondering if I accidentally return it to the library or something because mm-hmm. it's nowhere. Yeah, it's nowhere, and I'm actually kind of bummed about it because it has like a couple of you know cute cards, like sentimental type stuff in it that I was using for bookmarks. It's actually, an old copy of Tolkien's. And has much of his notes in it. It's a priceless artifact, actually. And I think it was signed by him, too, wasn't it? Yeah. It wasn't, it like, personalized and everything? Well, considering it wasn't published during his lifetime, I highly doubt that. Right? Oh, oops. You walked right into that one. Well, now I'm confused. Yeah. Anyway, well, y'all, say a prayer that I find my copy of the Silmarillion. Mm-hmm. St. Anthony has still not come through for me. But I'm not going to give up on him. Hmm. What a powerful testimony. <laughs> Oh, man. Although, you know, last time I asked St. Anthony to help me, he didn't help me either, so maybe... What, when did this turn into ragging on St. Anthony? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Stream of consciousness. Yeah, seriously. You know, I uh, I have a proposal to make for this episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, since we only have one copy. Uh-huh. I think you should lead the discussion this time. Do you not remember how that went? Last time, you yeah, but this that? is a short. Uh, this is a short chapter. So can I use your notes as like my cheat sheet? Sure. Okay. That, that actually might be kind of fun because then it's like you know you're you you're like trying to take my thoughts after me. Yeah, let's do it. Like, why did John write down tacos right here in the march? <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? Hmm. What am I missing? Hmm. I must have misread this. Better go back and look it over closer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Did you do a haiku? I did do a haiku. Did you do a haiku? You know it. Did you do more than one haiku? Uh, no, I did one haiku. Just one? 
That's good. I only did one, too. Where is that? And I will tell you that it's not nearly as good as my last one. There it is. That's what I've been waiting for. Haku time. Haku time. Nice. You got some pretty sweet DJ moves there, Carswell. <laughs> pretty, uh... I was inspired by that, uh, Pretty sweet moves. The latest, uh, Comcast oh, commercial. Oh, the Comcast. Oh, is, it, is it Comcast? No, it's, it's Direct, Direct TV. TV. Yeah. Um, now, we're, now we're totally getting sued by both of them. By Comcast and Direct TV. Yeah. Well, we... we no, well, like we... The DJ, we, the DJ in there, he's like... Yeah. We are paying customers of both, so they Sorry. better not sue us. But yes, that latest one with the mailroom DJ? Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. I dig it. I totally dig it. All right. All right. We're doing rock, paper, scissors? Yes. See who goes first? Yeah. All right. You ready? Rock. That's on shoot, right? Yeah. You do your thing on shoot. Rock, rock paper, paper, scissors, scissors shoot. shoot. Oh, Boom. Johnny wins. Right, you want me to go first or you want to go first? Um, I'll go first. All right. Do it. Out of depths, Olmo speaks, Water Father, Flood Lord, good tw- good tidings toward men. I can oh. do that again because I almost said twidings. <laughs> I was wondering what that All was. All right, let's try again. <laughs> Out of depths. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Out of depths. Depths. That's a hard word to say. It is because you have the P and then the th. Yeah. Yes. All right. All right, now that I've totally ruined my haiku. I'll try again. I'll try again. Out of depths. Olmo speaks, Water Father, Flood Lord, good tidings toward men. Hmm. I like that. That's really good. Reminds me of uh, Good King when Celeste came out. Mm-hmm. That's a whole good ca- good tidings thing. Yeah. Did you pick up on my Wait, phone? is that not, that's not Good King when Celeste. On your pun? Yeah. Good tidings. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> nice. I did not until you mentioned it. That's pretty awesome. Yep. I like that. I like that a lot. And I think I just referenced the wrong Christmas song. Because it's not Good Tidings. That's We Wish You Merry Christmas, not Good King Wenceslas. All right. Anyway, here's mine. Of men we now learn. There's not much to say, but that lesser than elves they be. Yar. Uh Uh-huh. No, that should be lesser elves. Lesser elves. I have an extra syllable on that last line. Okay, I'm going to do it again. Of men, we now learn there is not much to say but that lesser elves they be. Yar. Yar. Are you pirate Johnny? They be. Yar. <laughs> lesser elves they be. Yar. Yar, maybe. Where's my rum? Yeah, that was not what I was going for, but I can see why you would interpret it that way. Nice. Yeah. Lesser elves. Uh, do we have any others? Any other haikus? No, no, no other haikus this time. What happened to our super fans? <sighs> Dang, we like take a couple weeks off and they just poof, disappear? You know? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. We'll have to see. Wow. Let's I see am what shocked. I'm truly shocked. Yeah, well. I guess they, like, had lives to live or something. Yeah. Not writing, you know, homework to do, lives to live. Wow. I hope they know that that we really appreciate their haikus, and we're sad when they don't come. Mm Mm-hmm. Please send them next time. Please. Please. Please, sir. May I have some more haikus? All right, let's not, let's not lay on the guilt too thick there. I wasn't. <laughs> I was just doing my best Oliver impression. There you go. All right, should we just do this? Because this chapter is like way short. We should. And to be honest, kind of boring. Well, okay. So, uh... I, th- I want you to lead it, though. I, want you to I should have asked question. Mary Grace just to write us like a long-form poem. Because that's seriously, like... 
really would sum up this chapter. Well, she'll probably feel like she has to now that you've said something. Well, I'm not trying to pressure her, but it would be nice, but it's kind of too late now. All right, <clears throat> so I'm leading for reals. No, it's not too late. Anybody who wants to still write haiku or poetry. But it's too late for my purpose because I was thinking, so. huh? They can absolutely do so. Well, yeah, okay. Right what now. I'm trying to say is it's not that it's like definitely too late, but it's too late for my purpose because yeah. my purpose would be just read the poem and be done. Because mm -hmm. that's what I want to do every time Mary Grace sends in a long form poem. Yeah. And just be like, all right, easy night for me. I'm, I'm going to bed. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? All right. Anyway, but no pressure, Mary Grace. No pressure. Um, you really want me to lead this discussion? Yeah. You realize we might lose a few listeners. Well, Maybe more than a few. I just want to... I think it'll be a fun experiment. All right. Uh, well, don't you have, like, show notes that I can use? I got the, I got my notes in the margins. Oh, these are? That, that's all yeah. you use on a regular yeah. episode? Oh, I thought you had more. Yeah. If you really don't want okay. to, you don't have to. Well, let me just try. Okay, Let, let's that's just, what I'm talking let about. Let me just yeah. try. Just try. And if it's a complete disaster, then we'll write the ship. No one's paying for this. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And you do get what you pay for. So. Especially when it comes to the Tolkien Road. <laughs> we try to get you the most value possible for your buck. <laughs> Except boy, for tonight. Boy, we're really bringing the quality hardcore. Man. Yikes. We're really talking ourselves up here. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. So, chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Of men. A simple title for a fairly simple chapter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, if you all remember where we left off, uh, the chapter right before this was called Of the Sun and Moon and the Hiding of Valinor. Why are you laughing? I just thought it would be funny if you'd be like, all right, chapter 12 of men. And for those of you who wonder where we left off, the chapter right before this was called chapter 11. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't let me finish my thought. I know, I know. I thought I was doing pretty good, actually. I'm just... I was I'm just, feeling it, I'm man. I'm just eager with hilarity right now. You, you're like... You're like... Uh, Sorry, go you're ahead. You're rushing my buzz, I'm, yo. I'm, I'm stop. I'm stop. I'll stop. Go ahead. Okay. As I was saying, where we left off the chapter just before this one, we were talking about the moon, where the moon and the sun came from, and um, we talked about the... The gift that was born through the death of the trees, uh, which were, in fact, the sun and the moon. And we talked a little bit about, you know, their keepers and, uh, you know, how the moon is kind of obsessed with the sun and that little sweet relationship. And then we talked about the hiding of Valinor, how the Valar got kind of scared. We're not scared, but they decided that, you know, Morgoth was you know, probably going to make himself known. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to protect themselves. And so they arranged all these islands around, around uh, their little island of Valinor and um, protected it. But they did leave one way in and out of Valinor, and that was so that their pals, the elves, could come hang out with them whenever they wanted to. Right on. Right on. So that's... Uh, well, wait, wait, wait. No? Well... Yeah, but not like only certain elves, right? Only the mm -hmm. elves that remain behind. Yeah, just want right. to be sure that's Cause, cause, right. They didn't. They didn't want. They wanted. They weren't like, oh, fan or come on back and hang out with us. Oh, right, time, you know? right, right. Yeah, no. Only, only the elves that were that were in their good graces, right, could come back. Um, and those were the Teleri. Yes. Um. So that's kind of where we left off. So Valinor is hidden. And now we delve into chapter 12, where the men wake up. Men wake up. Um, but first, there's this little paragraph about Olmo. Mm -hmm. And if you all remember, Olmo is a Valar. Mm -hmm. He's the sailor. He's the one that's like in charge of the seas and the waters. And he's almost pretty much the only guy who's... Like, cares that Morgoth is there. Is that right? Um, Did I read that right? Well, yeah, I guess I guess I'd say that he's the he's the Valar that hasn't just 
huddled back behind the um, back into Valinor and mm-hmm. um, and has like shut himself off from the rest of the world. Uh, almost always been kind of a free spirit in that way, you know. True. He's always been. Yep. Uh, he's never like preferred to hang out, just hang out in Valinor. He's always been out doing his thing in the seas, you know. Right. So. So he's the only one that's not just hiding. Right. Right. Um, and it says that most in mind, Ulmo kept the exiles mm-hmm. who gathered news of the earth through all the waters. So, John, can you tell me who are these exiles that 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 are being referred to here? Who are well, these exiles that almost keeping in mind? I think it's. I mean, I, I assume he's talking about the Noldor. Right? The Noldor, the the group yeah. of elves. Yeah, Fanor and the and his people, mm-hmm. right? The exiles, right? The ones who um, left Valinor. Yeah, that would seem. Yeah, that makes sense. Case. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um... Uh, then it goes on to talk a little bit, too, about how we're kind of... Are we entering into a new time now or like a new way of keeping time? Well, I think the way it's working is... Um, so before, when the trees were around, they kept time according to the trees, right? And, mm-hmm. the, and mm-hmm. kind of the, the, the waxing, waxing and waning of the trees, right. right? Now that the trees are gone... So, so think about these terms. Originally, what did you have? In the world, darkness. No, in the in the very first times. Oh, the very first times. Oh, before the trees. Yeah, before the trees. Remember back back that what far. Was there? It was pretty. Brief. Oh, the lamps. The lamps, the right? Lamps, yeah. Yeah, the lamps and the lamps, like brought perpetual light to the world, mm-hmm. right? Um, there so was there no was darkness. there was no darkness, mm-hmm. and then the lamps were thrown down, and. Um, and then there was darkness, and then out of that was where um, Yavanna and I think it was Yavanna created just just Yavanna. Yavanna created the two trees, um, and um, and so you have you've had these different ages based on like the years of the lamps and the years of the trees, and then now you're in the year of the years of the sun. Okay. Right, okay. where time is kept according to the the sun and the moon, right? The the ro- really the I rotation see. of the sun, okay. right? The, okay. Yeah. So, so we're entering into a different period of time, and okay. um, I believe this marks the beginning of what is officially the first age, right? The first age of Middle Earth, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Because everything before this is almost like prehistory. Gotcha. Right? Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yes. Um, and just for frame of reference, for those who don't know a lot about the the kind of history of Middle Earth, um, the Third Age is the age toward, and actually thousands of years into the Third Age is when, like, the Lord of the Rings, the action in the Lord of the Rings takes place. The Third right? Age. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So, so way, so way, way further down the road. From that. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. But, All right. So now we're. So now we're beginning in the time of the years of the sun. Right. And it says that this time is swifter and briefer than the years of the trees. Right. Um, does that mean that the days are shorter? Is that what that means? or? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure what that means, if it just means that there's fewer years or um, if time, like, per day goes by quicker or something mm, like that. Okay. I thought that was it talked a little bit in one, in one of the cha- earlier chapters about the different hours of the sun, but I think it's hard to answer the question of, um, like, does a did an hour and the time of the trees uh, was that equivalent to an hour like in the time of the sun? Mm, right? I, don't know. I see. Was it like a one to one? Yeah. Exchange. Maybe we'll maybe we'll figure it out more as we go. Okay. All right. Uh, and then it goes on to describe Middle Earth during this time, and, and it sounds like it's things are going pretty well. I mean, it says that things are growing, mm-hmm. right? There's lots of things are blooming. There's a lot of life, both on land and in the sea. Yeah. Um, and the Eldar increased, and things are green and fair. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's nice that, because, you know, things were so dark after... Um, after Mor- Morgoth and um, the giant spider, 
what's her name again? Unbelieved. Yeah. After they killed the trees, you know, right. it's almost like, oh man, this sucks. Like whoa, this is like, you know, you, you can't even, you can't even think about life getting back to normal again. And so right. it's encouraging now to to see that things are getting better. Not only are they getting better, but they seem to almost be better than they were before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is the time that the men... Right. Um, oh, it says their eyes are opened. Mm-hmm. The opening and the opening eyes of men were... Oh, okay. So the men come. And here's the question I have for you. Where did they come from? Like, were they, have they always been and then they just awakened? Or were they made out of, did well, they just all of a sudden exist? What does it say? Read what it says. Well, it says, quick. at the first rising of the sun, the younger children of Iluvatar awoke in the land of Hildorian, in the eastward regions of Middle Earth. But okay. the first sun arose in the west, and the opening eyes of men were turned towards it, and their feet, as they wandered over the earth, for the most part, strayed that way. So it says they awoke, which mm-hmm. means they must have been there. Right. Like well, and, and, and I forgot to look up where, where Hildorian is. Um, but yeah, they awoke. Much like the elves awoke, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. years before, um, under under starlight uh, on the shores of Quibian, right? Okay. Um so they were there, but they were just in a deep. Yeah, place. it's not really it's not really clear exactly what that means. Okay. Um, you know, and, and I don't I don't know what Tolkien had in mind there specifically. Um, there will be some interesting things we learn about men as we go along in the Silmarillion. Um, a l- we'll learn a little like some very vague things about their history. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Uh, yeah, there's just not a lot of information to go mm-hmm. off of when it comes to men, but I I found it really interesting, like what the um, the different names, all the different names. Yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. I, I laughed out loud at a couple of them. Yeah, like what? Um, well, I thought the uh, what was it the um, the usurpers. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Yeah, like, oh, I see how you mm-hmm. what you think of us men, right? Like we're just usurping your territory Mm -hmm. but they had i was surprised also at how many names they had for them right i mean they had a ton Mm -hmm. what what were some of your like what did you like was there a particular name that stood out to you or what what about the names intrigued you uh i liked the dudes yeah i don't think that's one of them it wasn't in there no it wasn't in there let me see the list you must be reading a different uh a different translation Mm mm-hmm was, uh, yeah, I didn't see that one. Let's see. Um, well, some of them are pretty insulting, like Ingvar the Sickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, the Night Fearers. The Night Fearers. Ha ha, yeah, you guys are afraid of the dark. Afraid of the dark, here it goes. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. The inscrutable. That's interesting. That's not really an insult, though, is it? Inscrutable. Well, it depends on how you mean it. Like you're, you could call somebody inscrutable and mean it as an insult, right? Oh, really? Yeah. You could say like, oh, you're, you know, you're just impossible to figure out. You know, like. Oh, uh, okay. You okay. know. Yeah. That's that's kind of what I think with that one. Okay. Um, I don't know what they mean by the heavy-handed. Yeah, I know. That seems like that would be one better suited for the dwarves. Yeah. With as rough and tumble as they are. Right. I mean, maybe maybe it has something to do with um, just that they're not as graceful as the elves are, you mm. know? Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe. Um, maybe. Like, you know, they, they always try to, like, fix things. You know, it's, it's with men being mortals as compared to elves being immortal, men probably, in the eyes of elves, men probably seem like they're always in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Because it's like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to yeah, die, I'm going to yeah, die, you know? Yeah. It's not like, I'm going to live forever. I don't have to, like, rush anything. You know, that's how elves, elves can afford to be that way. That's true. You know? That's true. Men, when it comes to it, they're like, huh, oh, I've only got, like, 60 or 70 years. i got to get stuff done, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, and there's there's not as much room to develop, like, gracefulness and everything, you know. 
I'm just I'm just speaking relatively, right? You know, if if you were an elf, you would probably look at men and say, "Man, they are always in a hurry to do things." Mm-hmm. You know, that's probably true. And probably um, true. and they always like go really extreme in all their measures because the the back of men's minds is like life is too short. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good point. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. It's really interesting, though, this, dyna- this dynamic that Tolkien sets up where men are not the main species of interest, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, because it's almost like we're seeing ourselves through the eyes of elves, you know, mm-hmm. like through the eyes of, you know, different different creatures, right? Yeah, yeah. And it feels like there's a lot of potential to um, to criticize us for our short, you know, for our nature and for like for maybe the way we behave, or just just to more deeply understand ourselves. I don't know. It, it, That's a good point. You know, yeah, I, like but that. all those all those names are are really good. Um, you yeah. know, just the way he lists lists all those off, and I think that really talks that that attests to how difficult it would be for beings like the elves to come to grips with like men who are like them in so many ways Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but at the same time are like you know we're these fragile beings who just die you know like one day we don't wake up anymore you know yeah it's got to feel really somewhat bizarre to them you know especially in this time when you know even though the elves have been through some things so far they still things are still relatively happy for the elves um but as time wears on that'll be less and less so and they'll start to view their immortality as as more of a burden the men yes. the elves will right you know? right now yeah absolutely. but we always you know we have that grass is always greener on the other side where men men are always like man it would sure be sure would be great to be like you guys and live forever you know right yep that's true yeah it's an interesting perspective for sure um, and yeah, and I agree <clears throat> that it does, it does kind of sh- strikes you as, it does, it is odd, <clears throat> like, that the men are not, not the primary focus here. I mean, mm-hmm. Tolkien makes it very clear that the, that the men are second, like right. they're the second people, right? right? Not the first, right? Those are the elves, right? You, you guys are just an afterthought, right? Right. Um, yeah, that is, that is interesting. And also, too, you know, another difference we see, not just with the mortality, but another difference between the, I feel like between the elves and the men here, are their relationship with the Valar, mm-hmm. right? It says that, that um, no Valar came, right, to guide the men, mm-hmm. or to summon them, like to invite them to Valinor. Right. Right? It was kind of like, they just went totally unnoticed. Mm-hmm. Right? They were like the Eeyore of the... Thanks for noticing the, me. <laughs> right. They were like, yeah. they didn't even get noticed. Right. Um, and it says that men have feared the Valar rather than loved them and have not understood the purposes of the powers, being at variance with them and at strife with the world. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so I think it, it paints this very, almost like an underdog picture of the men. Right? Uh-huh. Here they are coming up second, right? They don't have the benefit of having the Valar on their side. Right. right? They have no no help, no guide. No friends, basically. And, and here they are just kind of trying to make a way for themselves. Mm-hmm. What were you going to say? Um, well, I was going to say it's interesting to consider that since men woke up under the sun, would men have woken up if it had not been for the oh, destruction of the, the two trees? Of the trees. Yeah. That. It's sort of an interesting thing to consider mm-hmm. in this mm-hmm. whole scheme. Um you know, and it gets into that question of providence and what Iluvatar has planned ultimately. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I know later on it talks about how aspects of men are not written into the music of the Ainur, was not in the music of the Ainur. So they're kind of a, you know, they're, they're a separate thing on the part of Iluvatar. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but they definitely come from a different cloth mm-hmm. than the elves. Um, but there is one person that does take notice of them, right? Mm-hmm. And who is that? Good old Elmo. Elmo. Elmo the what like to Elmo call the Muppet. Elmo. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It says 
Will Moe nonetheless took thought for them, mm-hmm. aiding the council and will of Monway. So does that mean that Monway, like, gave, basically gave him permission or asked him to do this? Wait, say what? Well, it says that Will Moe nonetheless took thought for them, aiding the council and will of Monway. Aiding the council and will of Monway. So it sounds like Monway didn't want them then to be alone. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, I think that's true. I don't think Monway, like, intends to just completely abandon um, anyone, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but they men were not important enough for him to go. You, using that word inscrutable, himself. using that word inscrutable, I think sometimes, I think the Valars, especially the councils of Monway, because mm-hmm. remember, Monway is the only guy that can, like, speak directly to Iluvatar. Right, 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 right. yep. Um, and I don't think he's really allowed to share what he learns from Iluvatar. Mm. Um, and so Monway can be a little bit inscrutable sometimes. We've been dealing a lot with that where we're like, why doesn't he go after Melkor? And, you know, right, right, right. Um, and these sorts of things. So um, I think, you know, I think, I think it's saying that whether, Ul- whether Monway tells Ulmo to go do it or Ulmo just does it because he thinks it's something Monway would want him to do, mm-hmm. yeah, there's some, some kind of connection. Either way, we know that, that Ulmo is working in accordance with Monway's. Yeah. Will, one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, as a result of Umo's care for the the men, we learned that the men loved the waters. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, what is up with this? So, wait, so it says that they, therefore they loved the waters and their hearts were stirred, but they understood not the messages. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Um, I think, you know, you know how like when you go to tour to, you're out in nature and you hear like a waterfall or Mm -hmm. you hear like just even like, you know, the babbling brook or just the sound of water and all of its like natural elements when you go to the sea or something like that. Um, and it's just a beautiful sound, Mm -hmm. beautiful calming. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, we've, uh, we put on. Some sometimes we you know we put on like a white noise when we're sleeping. That's just mm-hmm. like the sound of waves or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's because it's a very calming, yeah. soothing sound. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think it also does something to kind of spark this happy place in your imagination too. So mm-hmm. um, I think it. I think Tolkien is and Tolkien was really into this that whole idea right of the sea he he comes back to it at different times and i think he was trying to draw like you know the mystery of like why are we so drawn to that sound right why are we so drawn to the sound Mm. of the waters right Mm. um you know and so he's trying to personify it and say that there's olmo behind this right olmo is speaking to men and these waters that we don't really understand what he's trying to say right so we're drawn to them but we don't quite know why right Interesting. Yeah, I think that's what he's saying. I think that's what yeah, like Tolkien's bringing out there. That's good. Yeah, it is cool. Well, then it also mentions here, after that, it mentions the Dark Elves. Mm-hmm. Who are the Dark Elves? So, remember, if you go to our chart in the back, you've got all of the Quin- the, the Quindy, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Who are all the elves. And... Yeah, it's a little more like. Is it further back? Or... No, 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 you're you're good. All right. I forgot that chart was there. There's a few of them. It's the last one on the chart. Oh, I see it. There it is. There you go. Right here. All right. Oh, so there's there's okay. the whole chart. Okay. And then you've got, you basically have, two types of elves. The elves that have seen the light and the elves that have not seen the light. Okay. All right. The elves of the light and the elves of the darkness. Okay. The Moraquindi are the elves of the darkness, the dark elves. All mm. right. They never saw the light of the trees. All right. The Calaquindi are those that did see the light of the trees. Okay. Right? So when Orome came and summoned them all to go to Valinor, not everyone made the journey. Right. Right, right. Some of them got halfway and then stopped. Some of them didn't even start at all. Mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I see. So, so that's what it's okay. talking about when it talks about the dark elves. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So the men meet these dark elves. Right. And um, they befriended them. 
Right. And it says that men became the companions and disciples in their childhood of these ancient folk, wanderers of the elven race who never set out upon the paths to Valinor and knew of the Valar only as a rumor and a distant name. Mm -hmm. Are they going to play into much of the rest of the chapters, the Dark Elves? Uh, yeah, they definitely play, they play a role. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not as prominently as uh, the Noldor or even right. the Sendar, mm -hmm. but yes, they, they do, do, play, do a play a role. Yeah. What well, makes me happy you know that the men do have some friends, mm -hmm. even if they are Dark Elves. Well, and it's interesting, right? So you've got the the Light Elves, who mm -hmm. were the ones that went to Valinor, and then you got mm -hmm. the Dark Elves, who, mm -hmm. who didn't you know, make it. And then you've got the Sindar, who are the Grey Elves, right? Mm -hmm. And the Sindar are the Grey Elves because, though they didn't <clears throat> make the journey, finally, they still have Thingol as their king, who who is a Calaquendi, who did see the light, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they have um, uh, Melian. Right. As their queen, who is Amaya. Um, and they they lived basically on the shores that looked out over the ocean towards Valinor, right? Gotcha. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Anyway. Cool. Um, and then move it, moving on, it says that, um, again, it just kind of reiterates, I think, how that things are pretty good mm -hmm. right now. Morgoth hasn't been back for that long. Um, there was not much trouble right, right? Um, and that things were budding and they were in bloom and you know the children of men wandered and their joy was the joy of the morning before the dew is dry when every leaf is green so pretty pretty nice place yeah things looking good mm-hmm yeah uh, should we pause for a commercial break there, you think? Or should we just keep going? No, no, let's, plug on, let's plug on through. There's not much left, so, okay. yeah. Um, I'm new at this, so I just wanted to make sure I wasn't, you know, yeah. stretching things out. All right. Uh, so, anyway, it's, it talks about how nice things are in Middle Earth right now. But then it says, But the dawn is brief, and the day full often belies its promise. And now the time drew on to the great wars of the powers of the North, when Noldor and Sindar and men strove against the hosts of Morgoth, Boglier, how do we say that? Boglier. Bog Boglier. Yeah. And went down in ruin. So, following this green blossoming time, there's war uh -huh. in the north. And it appears that Morgoth won. Right? Because it says that the Noldor, Sindar, and men went down in ruin. Well... That doesn't necessarily mean he won. Well, right. it means that he won the battle, this particular battle, right? Yeah. I think that's meant to be more of an all-encompassing statement about what we're about to get into. Oh, okay. I don't think it's meant to talk about one specific event. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, so there's, there's now there's fighting going on, and it says that, that basically these... these um, these seeds, these deceptive seeds of lies that Morgoth has has slay, has um, sowed, like with Feanor and other people, that they basically are working. Mm -hmm. right? So there's definitely evil creeping in, mm -hmm. um, and and it says that in those days, elves and men were of like stature and strength of body, but the elves had greater wisdom. And skill and beauty, and those who had dwelt in Valinor and looked upon the powers as much surpassed the dark elves in these things as they in turn surpassed the people of mortal race. So both, I mean, it sounds like um, it sounds like both the elves and the men are working against Morgoth. Yes. Um, is there anything else that we need to worth talking about with that regard? I mean, it says the elves were, were wiser, right? They had more skill and they were more beautiful. Right, but still, uh -huh. like the men are definitely like low, low men on the totem pole at this point. Right? Yeah, they are. So, I mean, they're still very new, still very yeah. new in the world. And again, they don't, you know, an elf will just live and live and live, and in that in his, in the span of his life, um, you know, generations of men will. 
pass away, right? Whole generations, right, mm. will pass away. So yeah, um, and also this is this is giving us a little taste. It's just introducing men. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not. Uh, we haven't any, we haven't really gotten any of the specific any of the specific interactions between men and elves yet, which we'll get into in other chapters. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and it mentions Melian. Right. Um, and it says that um, only in in her realm did the Sindar come near to match the Calaquindi. Oh, we just mentioned the Calaquindi. They were right. The, the, the light. that saw the light. Right. The, the so basically the Sindar were the only one who came close to kind of being on par with mm-hmm. the Calaquindi. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it talks about the mortality of the men versus the immortality of the elves. So elves can be destroyed, like they can be killed, mm-hmm. but they don't die of disease um, or sickness like men do. Right. Um, and it says in those days they were more like, in those days they were more like to the bodies of men, talking about the elves. Um, the elves in those days, they were more like the bodies of men since they had not so long been inhabited by the fire of their spirit which consumes them from within the courses of time. Mm-hmm. You underlined that and put a star by it, so I'm assuming you thought that was important, but I don't know why. Well, you're supposed to be thinking my thoughts after me. I bet I can't. I'm, I'm, I, I'm at a loss. Uh, the fire of the spirit where consumes them from within in the courses of time. And in those days, they were more like to the bodies of men since they had not so long been inhabited by the fire of their spirit, which consumes them from within in the courses of time. So it's saying the elves were yeah. more like men at that time. Um, Is that also just saying because they hadn't been around that long? Yeah, I think um, it, it's an interesting thing to say because we think of immortality as having no effect, but I think maybe the... Um, It's that whole thing of immortality becoming a weariness mm. over time. Like, it's mm. all great for the first couple thousand years. <laughs> and, then, and then, especially in a world that's that ha, that is that has sorrow and death and those kinds of things. Mm, okay. Um, and suffering, like, you... After a while, you're like, man, death would really be a relief right now. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we, we've heard discussion of that, where they yeah, talk about yeah. the elves kind of consider that like oh actually death doesn't sound you know so bad to some of them in some cases Mm -hmm. so i have to think that the fire of their spirit is referring to just the way that having to deal with everything in the world wears them down after a while and that probably does start to have a physical manifestation yeah well how can it not Mm -hmm. i mean how can i you see so much and you go through so much and even if it's not a physical wearing down, there's got to be some kind of spiritual yeah. wearing, just of the soul, right. right, and of the mind, too. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely, I've definitely known times where, um, you know, it, it feels <laughs> like life in a weary state, especially when there doesn't feel like there's a really solid light at the end of the tunnel. It can be very trying. Even if, mm-hmm. like, physically mm-hmm. you're in a good shape, um, you just, when you go through times where you're, like, spirit, very spiritually dry and you just don't have that sense, like, hope is the thing. Like, like if a person has hope, they can get up every day and rally themselves and be like, all yes. right, you know. Yeah. Uh, when, when you're just, like, you you know, imagine yourselves in the shoes of the elves, like living day after day after day after day, and after several thousand years of that, and you're just like, "This is getting old." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what I do with that. That's yeah, how I interpret that. that. So. Yeah, I like that. It's good. Very good, John. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, so that's interesting. It's you know just the fact that yeah, maybe the grass is not as greener on the other side as we. You know, as the men may think, mm-hmm. or the, um, with the whole mortality versus mortality thing. Um, but what's interesting is that it goes on to say that what it talks about the death, right? And because the elves are immortal, 
um, and the men are not, it says, what may befall their spirits or the spirits of men after death, the elves know not. So the elves, when they, when they, they go to the halls of Mandos, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And they're not sure if the elf, if the men go to the same place. Right. Right. Um, and take, men aren't sure what happens yeah, to men themselves aren't sure either. What happens yeah. either, but they know that they're not immortal, right? Um, and it says that um, it says under a Lu- and Mondos under a Luvatar alone, save Monwe, knows whether they go after the time of recollection in those silent halls beside the other sea, right? So, yeah, what's what's not mentioned there, but we learn in one of the earlier chapters is that men are, like, afraid of death, too, right? Mm-hmm. Men are like, mm-hmm. you know, oh, again, it's all good for you elves. You know that you go to the halls of Mondos when you die. Which well, is a pretty cush deal. Yeah, well, yeah. supposedly, I don't know. There might be a bad place to go, you know, but... Um, at least they know. But at least they know what's yeah. gonna, what, what lies on the other side for them, right? Right, yeah. Uh, for men, it's like, it's like we, don't have, we have no idea what happens when we die. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. So death is, is a terror to them. You know, it was a fearful it's thing to them. Very, it's a big unknown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they thought this was interesting. I was a little confused by this. It says, None have ever come back from the mansions of the dead, save only Baron, son of Barahir, whose hand had touched a Silmaril, but he never spoke afterward to mortal men. So I don't know. I have not read the story of Baron and Luthien. Like, we've talked about it, and mm-hmm. I learned a little bit about it, because no, I have not read your book yet. Shame, shame. I'm making it the sign of an L on my forehead as I speak. Uh, but apparently, Baron comes back from the mansions of the dead. Is that a true story? Uh, well, yeah, you just gotta read it, right? We'll get there, but. Well, that, does that, does that, why does it mention that here, though, without us having again read the this story is, of Baron? This is kind of like a summary chapter to okay. introduce us to men. It's okay. not. It's not meant to be, like, necessarily a continuation of... You know, I don't know how I feel entirely about the way... Because this was all compiled by Christopher Tolkien. And oh, then this guy named um, right. Guy Gabriel K, I think, is his name. And after Tolkien the Elder, J.R.R. Tolkien, had passed away. And I'm sure they did their best. And I'm not... You know, I guess I'm questioning their judgment a little bit, but... Part of me thinks it would have been smarter to have it just be like a really sequential story um, okay. instead of having, because in the middle of it, you kind of get, you have this like incredible action pickup with the two trees and the chasing. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you have like, like this chapter and then like two or three more chapters where it's just like, not a lot happens. Okay. And the next chapter, actually some stuff happens. I'll take that back. Um, but yeah, this chapter like could could was this was this chapter really necessary to fit in as a separate chapter? Or could it have been part of another chapter? I don't know. Hmm. Okay, that makes sense. I didn't even think about how the, the fact that Tolkien himself did not compile mm-hmm. this history. So it makes sense. There might be a couple of questions that arise here and there. Um, and then finally, at the end of the at the end of this chapter, it talks about how the elves and the men become estranged, uh, basically because of the triumph of Morgoth. Right. And it says that that's what he most wished. He wanted the elves and the men to become estranged, which makes sense. Right. Right, because you know, a house divided itself against itself cannot stand. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like this last paragraph is just kind of like a. You know, just tying up all those kind of loose ends, right? Yeah, so the elves and men, they don't like each other anymore. And then the Quindy are wandering along. And uh, you got... Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on. Like, what's the point of this last this last little bit here? It's a summary again. And it, and it just... Summary. That's it, the key word. Guys, have you haven't picked up on that yet? Summary? Yeah. Is the key word of this episode. It is. Well, it's a short chapter and summarizes mm-hmm. a lot of things. Yes, it does. I'm not giving you our time. I'm just saying. I think it's funny how many times we've used that word. Yeah. This this episode. That's all. So, summary. It's all summary. Well, and in the glory and beauty of the elves, and in their fate, full share had the offspring of elf and mortal, Arendel and Elwing, and Elrond, their child. Elrond. Yeah. So, Elrond 
um, is the child of an elf and a mortal. Right. Was he in the Lord of the Rings movie? Is that yeah. that Elrond? That's the one they're talking yeah, about. Of course, the one yeah. that they that they made in Rivendell. Mm-hmm. I see. I did not realize that he was a. Uh, I, I thought he was full elf. I didn't realize that he was he was a half elven. Half half elf. Yeah, I thought he was yeah. full. Interesting, huh? I didn't realize he was a muggle. I yeah. mean, a half a, elf. A mud blood. Mud blood. Yes. <laughs> well, that's cool. So we we find out where Elrond comes from. Yeah. Uh, what did I miss? What else do we need to discuss? Anything? I think that covers it. Um, okay. we, did, did you have a favorite passage? Nope. You didn't? Well, the names. I guess the names. The names? The names was my favorite My favorite part of the whole thing. Mine was... What What did you like about the names? I want to talk about those. I thought they were funny. Okay. And insulting. And it gives me some really good... Really good uh, things to call people I don't like next time I run into them. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. That's always helpful. Yeah, I know. So I always nice to have a fresh, a fresh pot of insults ready to be spread. Spread. I can't. So I don't want to say spread or shared. So I said spread. You're such an afterboard. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, burn. Night fear. Night fear. That's like my new favorite one. Mm. Next time the kids ask me to leave the lights on, I'll be like, "What are you, night fearers?" Like yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite passage? Heavy handed. <laughs> hey, um, John, don't be so heavy handed. Mine was this. Olmo, nonetheless, took thought for them, aiding the counsel and will of Monwe, and his messages mm-hmm. came often to them by stream and flood. But they have not skill in such matters, and still less had they in those days before they had mingled with the elves. Therefore they loved the waters, and their hearts were stirred, but they understood not the messages. I just like the mystery of the water. You know, I love water. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I love the, especially like the ocean, mm-hmm. but just the sound of water. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love the way he personifies the mystery of it associated with it. Like we feel like, you know, I think we feel like water somehow speaks to our souls in a very deep way. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I mean, that we begin in water. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, the womb is water. Yeah. Right? So I think it's just a very, it's it's a sound that we're aware of even before we're aware of being aware. Right. It's a very comforting, soothing sound. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Good call. I like that. I like that passage. Cool. So what's on tap for next next time? Um, chapter 13? We shall go to chapter 13 next right. time, which is mm-hmm. of the return of the Noldor. And actually, quite a bit had, does happen in that chapter. Um, okay. Yeah. So the Noldor come back. Right. Where are they? Uh, they're in Beleriand. Okay. Yeah. And that's who uh, Feanor's hanging yeah. out with, right? Right. That's his tribe. Right. Yeah. Yep. Just making sure I'm keeping all my, my ducks in a row. You got it. All right, cool. Well, that'll be fun. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have a new copy of the Soul Ruling by then so we can both have reference to it. I know. Well, hopefully my... Like, it's got to be around here somewhere. Yeah, well, it's I mean, we're going to have to get a new copy anyway just because you threw my, my this copy on the ground. Whatever, it's not even broken. Because you broke my book. I did not break it. <laughs> it is not broken. It just falls open at a particular point. That's all. Yeah. Well, tell it to the judge. We'll find it. We won't be spending any money on a third copy of a book, hopefully. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Peace out, y'all. Thank you guys for listening, for... Hey, Greta, good, good job. Listening on to my, my, my inaugural mm-hmm. discussion yeah. leading. Good job. If you are still listening, I appreciate your time. You can just call her MC, De- MC Jazzy Greta. MC <laughs> Jazzy Greta. <laughs> call me Dr. Gray. Dr. Gray? Dr. Nice. Gray. Nice. <laughs> well, thank you all for Gray-Z. tuning in. Gray Z. Ah, I like Gray Z. That's pretty That's good. Right. Gray Z and Dr. Gray. Mmm. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, need to, uh, I'll need to think those over. See, think about which one I prefer. Mm, I don't know. It's tough. Tough, tough. call. Tough it's call. Tough. Way to complicate the issue. Yeah. All right. Well, that was just fun. Thanks for uh, giving me the reins. You betcha. I appreciate it. Well yeah. done. Thank you, dude. All right. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. Thanks, everybody. Talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? 
It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On the next episode, we continue our discussion of the Silmarillion with Chapter 13 of The Return of the Noldor, wherein we learn the fate of Feanor and witness to the rallying of the Noldor against Morgoth. Please tune in, and until next time, the road goes ever on. Hey, 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 Tolkien Roadsters! What's shaking? Greta Carswell here, just getting my groove on to the Tolkien haiku theme music. Man, that's an awesome song. You know what else is awesome? Feedback on the Tolkien Road on iTunes. Oh yeah, you heard me right. iTunes feedback is one of the best ways you can tell the world about your undying love for this podcast. Because it lets those knuckleheads at Apple know that the Tolkien Road is where it's at. I mean, come on. Why didn't they know that already? Am I right? So next time you're waiting in line to pick up some delicious tacos, surfing the World Wide Web, brushing up on a Tom Bombadil factoid, or keeping it real in whatever way you keep it real, pop on over to iTunes and let the human race know what you think about the Tolkien Road. We're all dying to know for reals. Party on, y'all!